So the reading this morning is from Luke chapter 19, verses 28 to 48, about the triumphal, triumphal entry. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell him the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus through their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles that they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Then he entered the temple area and began driving out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find any way to do it, because all the people hung on his words. I was talking about this and that, and the guy insisted on speaking to me in differently able terms. You ever heard that? Differently able of, uh, of course, you're differently abled and so on. I, I'm sure he meant it quite well, albeit somewhat woke. But after a while, I got tired of this. And I simply said, actually, I prefer the term complete spastic. Nothing like calling a spade a spade, is there? Which brings me neatly to Palm Sunday, because if ever there was a sanitised, differently able version of events, it has to be Palm Sunday. There's different ways of looking at Palm Sunday, the right way and the wrong way. The first way, is to see it as a nice little story, a twee story. Here's Jesus coming to town on a baby donkey. It isn't that sweet. And everybody loves him. And they're taking the leaves off the palm trees so over, that's in the Gospel of John, and they're lining his way with them. And cloaks. Luke just mentions the cloaks. They're putting their cloaks on the ground and the donkey is walking over them. You've got the donkey and the palm fronds and the cloak and the king of the universe accepting adoration from his people. The disciples, they're celebrating, aren't they? Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. The crowd are loving it, except a couple of Pharisees which really weren't in party mood. 
I'll get, I guess we've all seen artist impressions of this. I know I have. You get this curiously looking, uh, European looking Jesus. Big smile, nice teeth, long hair, but nicely groomed. Could be a male model, couldn't he? And the crowd are there cheering him on. You never see the Killjoy Pharisees, so just big cheesy greens all the way around. So what if the crowd turned out to be a little fickle and a couple of days later wanting to talk to death? Doesn't spoil Palm Sunday. They're all for him today. So that's the wrong way. Another way of looking at Palm Sunday, also the wrong way, is to, is to say this, it's a nice idea and a good day out, but it put a few noses out of joint and led to the crucifixion. Bad planning. They think it was bad planning or bad timing. Jesus haven't won over the big wigs of that town and he tips up like he owns the place. They wanted to kill him for some time. And it's a little insensitive for Jesus to organise a parade. Asking for trouble, that is. So Jesus was insensitive and guilty of bad planning or bad timing. And it got him into a world of trouble. Well, some people think that. Jesus went a little too far on Palm Sunday and then he got overtaken by a prince. You know what? Those guys are like the Flat Earth Society. Never let the facts colour their opinions. The truth is, Christ wasn't uh, overtaken by uh, events. He carefully orchestrated them. It was an attempt, a, a very successful attempt, to provoke a crisis. Ever seen that? You will. Exhibit A, the donkey. Do you ever wonder what that was about? Maybe you know that Solomon tipped up in his uh, coronation on his dad's donkey. And of course, Jesus was also a son of David. The significance of that wouldn't be lost on the crowd. But there was a diff deeper significance. And to know what that is, you either have to uh, have a taste of obscure passages of the Old Testament or know somebody who does, like me. Because the Old Testament tells us that no animal has ever been used for beast of burden, uh, beast of burden can be used for sacred purposes. That is why he was a cult that no one had ever ridden. Jesus, again, was sending a message and it would not have been lost on the Pharisees. He sent them messages before that. Even on the day he was born, he sent them messages. He chose to be born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem was known for only one thing before Jesus, it was a place lambs were raised, especially reared for temple sacrifices. It was the only choice for the Lamb of God. And it's met his time again. Jesus rode out uh, the cult to show them that he was sacred. It was the only uh, recorded time he rode any animal. And I'm sa uh, he's saying, I'm sacred, I don't care. Who knows it? It's true, yes, but it's also very provocative. But it moves on from there. Exhibit B. The disciples are shouting out, Blessed are the king who comes in the name of the Lord, because that is up the ante. He's not just sacred. Now he's a king. More than that, he's a king with a divine mandate. He comes in the name of the Lord. And this is too much for the some, some of the Pharisees. Don't shout anything 
uh, for the contrary, probably because they don't want to be lynched by the crowd. They just see, teach up, rebuke your disciples. Oh, he's going to do that, isn't he? His response is interesting. I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. And the fact is, is they don't call his bluff simply because he's not bluffing. They've, de they've seen too many miracles to suppose that won't happen. The Pharisees are having a crisis. They must be in panic mode by now. Their positions depend upon the established religious order. A sacred king with a God-given mandate will be extremely difficult to accommodate in the existing setup. But if their positions depend on the established religious order, their lives depend on the secular order. Because if they have to go to the Roman, uh, Roman authorities and sell, tell them that a Jew has been set up as a king, they'll be taking their home, heads home in a bag, won't they? Picture this. You've got, you, they go and tell Pilate he's got a rival, a king who has the support of the Jewish um, people. And before Pilate shortens and by, by the head, he wants a full report. So they get to the piece about palm branches. That will ring a bell with Mr. Pilate. Because just a hundred years before, Jesus, Jesus, uh, Judas Maccabeus set himself up as king of the Jews. They kicked their Romans out. And, he, and his followers weren't waving AK-47. They were waving palm branches. He put palm branches in the temple to celebrate his victory over Rome. He had coins struck with a mug on one side and palm branches on the other. The palm tree was a symbol to the Jews, but more importantly, the Romans knew exactly what that symbol meant. So the religious leaders have got a problem, and Christ is actually causing it. There seems to be a coup unfolding. But what happens when there is a coup? Well, these days, normally you get some guy in uniform, ludicrous amounts of gold, gold bright, pair of shades, you know, that sort of thing. And they're broadcasting just uh, from the uh, telly, uh, television station is just gone and back, commandeered. In those days, right up until the broadcasting was invented, the guy who'd taken over would ensconce himself in the palace or the parliament or whatever seat of power the regime is using. So if there was a reason result um, a revolt in Wales, he head to assembly, whatever, wherever the previous incumbent exercised in, in power and exhibit C, Christ heads of the temple, doesn't he? Well, of course he does. Because that is a seat of power. It's supposed to be about him anyway. But how in, in your face is that? He's provoking a crisis. And he drives out the uh, most obvious symbol of the new uh, old regime, the money changers, the sellers. In another gospel account, he brings in the sick, those who are never welcome, and he heals them. But here he moves in. He moves into the seat of power. Every day he was teaching at the temple. 
The people love him. The authorities hate him. As our reading tells, but the teach priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. That they could not find any do it because all the people hung on his words. Now they wanted to kill him a few times before, but now, now their hands have been forced. If they're going to keep their positions, if they're going to stay out of trouble with the Romans, then Jesus simply has to die. The situation is so bad, it's him or them, quite literally. Exhibit D, E and F, that D, uh, Jesus was deliberately prom uh, provoking a crisis happened after the reading. He, no <coughs> he does what nobody in history has ever done before or since. He's come to town, he's allowed people to pro proclaim him king, and he's taken over the seat of power. So far, it could be any leader of the coup. But no, uh, something no leader of a coup has ever done, Exhibit D, he leaves the power structure entirely intact. Think about that. He leaves the power structure entirely intact. They're not put to the sword from his followers. They're not even relieved of their post. How bizarre is that? Well, not as bizarre as Exhibit B, E, sorry. Because nobody who comes to town allows people to proclaim him king, but then leave, uh, it, it leaves the existing order intact and withdraws with a handful of followers to be where, um, where he can easily be picked up without a major conflict would reasonably expect to live now, would they? But Jesus didn't expect to live. That was the point of the crisis. And F is that nobody who wanted to survive would allow a known traitor to walk away from the meal and call for the enemy. This was a man absolutely determined to be killed. Rather different from the sanitized, differently able person, isn't it? I wonder how they deal with the crucifixion itself. After all, scourged, beaten, whipped, stripped, then the crown of thorns, then the nails. And even when he was sweating blood, begging his father, yet not my will, but yours be done, his faithful friends went for a nap, didn't they? Why did he go through all that? Luke 23 gives us a clue. Uh, gives us a clue. Luke 23. The other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God since you're under the same sentence? We are punished ju justly, for we are getting what I did deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I say to, uh, to tell you, Today, you will be with me in paradise. One man, just one man. Was it worth it? Well, we're all criminals, aren't we? Whether that's greed or lust or vanity or pride or ego or whatever else, we all fall short. And such is the ferocious, unimaginable love of Jesus that 
despite the pain, he made him a promise that this day he would be in par paradise. One man, perhaps, which you know, countless others have followed just that path. In verse 41, he said, we are punished justly what our deeds deserve. Puts me in mind of a famous scripture that the wages of sin are death. That's true. But it's also true that the gift of God is eternal life. So, What's it going to be? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for uh, Palm Sunday and all it means to me. And thank you too for the unswerving loyalty of Jesus on the cross. Help me to commit to following Jesus whatever should happen. In his name I pray. Amen.